So this week, I went to a training and discussion at Natikis United, which is a group many of you are familiar with, I think. Last year, we hosted two concert fundraisers here for this group, and our own Lee Manuel is on the leadership team. And the discussion I attended was about having those sensitive conversations about race, gender, religion, and privilege that we know we should have, but that we have trouble getting around to. At the meeting, I found myself actually in the midst of sincere and thoughtful people who are open to many different cultures and perspectives that exist in our town. But as part of this group, I was also presented with something of a challenge. Recognizing my own place of privilege as someone who gets to talk and be listened to a lot, I am a professional talker after all, I spent most of the meeting trying to keep my mouth shut and my ears open. But it wasn't really much of a sacrifice to listen to other people. In fact, it was kind of fun. And it was energizing to be part of something, part of a practice that could change the core of how we relate to each other as individuals and as a society. And as I sat there with my mouth shut, it turned out I was pretty good at it. I keep, kept, okay, thank you, Lee. I did tell some jokes. I kept thinking of the passage from Isaiah that we read today. Look, I am doing something new, it says. Now it springs forth. Can you perceive it? Can you perceive it? Now, of course, usually when we hear this passage, we think of an older translation. Behold, I am doing a new thing, it says. But the message remains the same. The divine is dynamic and changing. There are new things happening all around us, all the time. And we, too, are capable of change. We, too are capable of doing something new. Now, of course, when one leaves a meeting like that, where doing a new thing, where the changing of hearts and minds and actions is the goal, or when we leave worship on Sunday morning, where we have spent time equipping ourselves to live into what we want to become, when we leave a place like that, or like this, we find that the world we re-enter doesn't always recognize that transformation we are trying to make. For example, we may be energized by the idea of living more just and holy lives, or of building the commonwealth of heaven. Movements like Me Too and Black Lives Matter may inspire us to see the world differently. And the Apostle Paul may remind us to not conform to this age, but to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. But, but, but these are challenging propositions, aren't they? And as we have seen in numerous ways, large and small, over the years and months and days, there are people and powers who see a threat to the old ways, who choose not to conform to the new spirits, and instead decide to stay in their comfort zone by looking back to an ideally idealized and frequently selectively true past that reinforces their own habits and authority, their own privilege, and of course, they would like us to look back, too. Sometimes they are us. We confront attitudes and unexamined habits in our culture, in our neighbors, in our families, and in ourselves that push us off the spiritual path we are on, that keep us from moving forward, and make us feel that lack of inner adequacy 
that lack of inner adequacy that Robert Cummins mentions in our reading today. Without a religion of meaning and vitality, he says, we are not likely to emerge from our confused state. We do not help ourselves or our cause when we do this work of transformation and renewal without regard to our spirits. Like a sort of secular fundamentalist, we sometimes fall into the trap of believing that the only reward is at the end. When we have conquered our particular demon or somehow won a never-ending campaign for equality, as if somehow the sacrifices themselves that we make are paradoxically what are meant to sustain us. Operating from our faith, however, operating from our faith, we can, if we wish, allow ourselves to see those other immediate rewards. Theologically, we become closer to understanding our own souls. Pragmatically, we improve our relationships, our health, physical, psychological, and social. And since many of our changes have a justice component, we do, in fact, change the world a little bit each day with each positive step. But, again, but, but it turns out that the path of transformation and renewal is largely uphill. That's why we have trouble walking it. We struggle to recognize in our uphill climb the victories in our small steps. And while we know that the taller the mountain is, the more spectacular the view is from the top, we also get tired. The mountain is so tall, and the pace is so slow. It is a struggle not to succumb to despair and to head back down, down into the valley of what is normal and acceptable today. With all its familiar problems and injustices. And this is why we need to rest. And this is why we need to note our own history and to make the time to celebrate how far we have come even as we move on. Religion, Cummins notes, is an impulse working within us to make us greater than we are, and through us to make the world better than it is. Religion is an impulse, he says, working within us to make us greater than we are, and through us to make the world better than it is. It would be good, I think, for us to heed that impulse when it tries to reward us for our efforts. Now, one of the four pillars of NIU in these conversations that we're having and elsewhere is, in fact, celebration. Celebration. And there is a reason for this. Celebration helps us to fill the gaps in our own souls, to refuel, to reconnect to the things that we love. And again, in Reverend Cummins' words, to think not so much of what we want as of what life wants of us. <clears throat> Henry Mitchell, one of the great teachers of preaching from the African-American style and experience, tells us that it is just good theology to insist that the tone of the good news be joy and celebration. Questionable for centuries, he said, has been the theology which kept people off balance and manipulable by asking them to sing of themselves as wretches and worms. The good news of the grace of God, he concludes, embraces and affirms humble believers, healing and empowering them for service. It's just good theology, he says, to insist that the tone of the good news, which means the gospel, be joy and celebration. Which is to say that it is okay 
perhaps even holy and necessary, to find ways to reward each other and ourselves on this journey of transformation. How many of you know what a step counter is? See some hands? Good. Also called a Fitbit, if you spend a little money and get one on your, on your wrist. But I use the one that's an app on my phone. In fact, if you look at your phone, there's like four apps for this. And I picked one. And there's lots of things that I don't particularly like about it. The mechanism for measurement of steps on a phone is really vague, so I always feel like I've walked farther than it tells me. And of course, sometimes my phone, unlike a Fitbit watch arrangement, my phone is not on my person. It's connected to my Bluetooth and on the counter. And those steps, when it's on the counter, they don't get counted either. But what I do like about it is that it displays my daily step count in the form of a bar graph. So I can watch it go up during the day. Often it probably looks like I'm, I'm texting somebody when I'm usually just checking my steps. And every time I reach my goal for a particular day, which happens a little bit less than half the time, I would be honest, the bar turns green. And then, then there's this oddly pleasing little explosion of digital confetti. Ah. Ah. It's a tiny, tiny celebration of my accomplishment. And even though it doesn't happen all the time, I always want it to. So when it does happen, it totally makes the next 10 minutes of my day. We are at our best when we are like that man in the reading Timothy read today who got better at squash by reinforcing his small steps forward with tiny celebrations, even patting himself on the back when he thought no one was looking. As we think about what concrete <coughs> steps we can take in our lives to live into being the people we and the society we want to be, we need to build good moments into our step counters. We need parties and confetti, even if it's metaphorical or digital or private. And we need to mark the times of achievement, not just for ourselves, but for those who travel with us. Henry Mitchell writes that we have not faced squarely the emotional character of faith, hope, and love. And we need to do that. We need these small gifts or small victories. For though we live in troublous times, we can strengthen our humanity by moving through them and pushing against these troubles in joy. Let's take a moment in silence to think on these things.